island in space. Our home. Our civilization. Our human innovations. How could the omission of two simple digits affect the destiny of all humankind? Y2K, what does it mean? How will it affect you, your family, your community, your nation, our world? Y2K, how can we prepare individually? How can we work together as global neighbors to make the best of whatever may occur before and after January 1st of the year 2000? Y2K, from its historical roots to its possible effects on the future of civilization. Effects that are so complex that perhaps only chaos theory could calculate the multiple ramifications of what may occur. I'm Leonard Nimoy, your guide, as we explore all aspects of the Y2K phenomenon, including how we, humankind, can utilize Y2K as an opportunity to look at ourselves, to analyze where we've been, and to adjust our sights for the future. There is an ancient myth of what may have been the most highly advanced civilization ever to dwell on the planet Earth. Legend has it that this civilization was perhaps more technologically advanced than our human civilization is today, on the brink of the third millennium AD. But the legend also ends, suddenly, with the revelation that this entire ancient civilization vanished that their great island sank into the sea because their technological innovations were too far ahead of their human judgments, human foresight, and simple human frailties. This legendary civilization was, of course, Atlantis. Yet the problem for us in the year 1999 is that we are no longer musing on what may or may not have happened a long, long time ago. Rather, we are now facing very real global issues related to power supply, satellite communications, water, health care, transportation, distribution of food, and other items vital to everyday human survival. These global issues are the direct result of an equally real human oversight many people now refer to as the Y2K, or Year 2000 problem, which derives from the fact that billions of lines of computer code and embedded microchips that now run the very technologies we all depend upon may fail in that briefest moment between December 31st, 1999 and January 1st, 2000. <laughs> We recall the fate of Atlantis. The primary question for our civilization as we approach the year 2000 is this. Have we allowed our own highly advanced technological innovations to far outpace our human abilities to control those innovations? And most importantly, to foresee their ultimate consequences? In order to find an answer to this fundamental question, and in order to prepare ourselves and our communities for whatever Y2K may bring, we need to understand the history and ramifications of Y2K from its very beginning decades ago to these remaining days of the 20th century as we confer with a cross-section of the men and women on the front lines of the Y2K campaign. We begin 
by returning to the startlingly simple roots of Y2K. When I get out here in these speeches and hearings and uh, other presentations, the first thing that comes up is that people say, is, say, how do we get into this mess? The story of Y2K really begins several decades ago, back in the 50s, with a very enterprising woman by the name of Grace Murray Hopper. Her nickname was Amazing Grace because of all the outstanding accomplishments in her life. One of her accomplishments was the invention of the compiler for computer programs, which translates regular written language into the ones and zeros of binary code. It was the idea that said the switch in a transistor is either on or off. And therefore, you can write code that can be read mechanically by a series of transistors strung together that show that they are either on or off. And that was the beginning of what we now call digital code. Maybe even more importantly, Grace Hopper was centrally involved in the creation of COBOL. COBOL, computer business-oriented language, became all pervasive throughout the computer systems of America and eventually the world. The technology itself is very prevalent in our advanced society, and the failure points um, potentially span from a very simple industrial process to a very complex uh, financial transaction. That we don't really understand the incredible impact of that little notion that a switch can be either on or off, that a punch in an IBM card can either be in or out. In the primitive days of computers, mainframes relied on the use of Hollerith cards, which were cardboard cards with holes punched in them, to create computer programs. They operated computers sort of like the way an old piano scroll would create music on a player piano. I'd been a university president for 18 years, and I remembered right away that we had these huge mainframe computers that took up room after room after room. The kind of computer power you can now get on a laptop used to require a system that was so large it literally had to be housed in its own building. So as more and more COBOL programs totaling in the millions and eventually billions were written on Hollerith cards, the sheer expense of computing began to really add up. And so in the 60s, some bright programmers said, wait a minute, why are we punching in 1967? Why don't we just put 67, save the 19? That's when major businesses and government institutions began finding ways to cut corners. And one of the most fateful cost-cutting measures was to deliberately leave out the first two digits of the year date. So in the year 2000, and they knew this at the time, you would have 00, zero pop up, not 20. Oh, oh. So the computer thinks it could be 1900. Oh, oh, oh. And that's the problem. So yeah, we may have saved a lot of money by eliminating those two digits, but here we are 40 years later, and the cost to correct problems because of this omission is in the trillions of dollars. Companies aren't spending $100 million or more, or and the uh, company's totally spending billions of dollars as a public relations device. They are doing it because they have a real problem to fix and a real challenge to face. That flaw that got put into the system in terms of two digits for a date instead of four has become, over the last 25 years, absolutely pervasive. We're not going to be able to predict with any certainty where the breakdowns may or may not occur. Uh, will it be a nuclear power plant? Will it be the uh, airplanes in the sky? Will it be the food supply chains, transportation? There are so many possibilities. Eight hospital system has probably 45,000 pieces of medical devices, of which probably 25% of those are going to need to be tested. The generation and distribution of electricity is, is really done with computers. The National Federation of Independent Business estimates that approximately 82% of all U.S. small businesses might have a problem, and only 50% had taken any kind of action by the middle of 1998. And the flaw is everywhere. Yes, it's in computer programs, software programs. It's also embedded into those microcomputers that we call chips. The embedded chip devices work anywhere or go anywhere from a um, dialysis machine, an anesthesia machine, 
a CT scanner, IV pumps, um, all different kinds of equipment that nurses use on the floor, um, lab equipment, lab devices, um, x-ray, pharmacy. It, it affects every department within a hospital. If you look at a, a production line now in automotive, uh, there is a tremendous amount of automation. You, in most cases, find that there's a, a, a software program running in there that has dates in it. And the estimates we get on our committee are that between two and possibly five percent of those chips will fail. And you don't know which two to five percent they are, and you don't know where they are. The early warnings about Y2K, however, were either ignored or deliberately rebuffed, primarily for economic reasons, but also due to bureaucracies typical of large corporations and government agencies. And people don't know in corporations how to approach this issue because we're looking at their whole enterprise. We're not just looking at a section. We're looking at all the code that's ever been written. We're looking at anything that's connected with the code. We're looking at outside vendors. We're looking at internal and external interfaces. This is not a technological problem. It sounds like it. It's a management problem. It is estimated that over $600 billion is being spent worldwide to address the Y2K problem. The simple dilemma is that there are so many lines of code and microchips that need to be reviewed that there are just not enough computer professionals and not enough days left before January 1st, 2000 to look into every area that must be addressed. It's a huge management challenge to uh, make the changes in all of the lines of code and all of the machinery and all of the embedded chips that are affected with this problem. The report card was established to get people's attention, and it has. Cabinet members talk about it, agency heads talk about it, that's what we want. Basically what we rate on that report card is the degree of progress that has occurred between the last quarterly report and the present. And you have five or six D's and five or six F's, you know you have a problem there. And I must say it did get a little attention among the cabinet. In some cabinet meetings they said, hey, what did you get from him? You know, so, but it, it puts it down where the public can understand it and not have a bunch of statistics that nobody can understand. You've got the software problem that people can quickly understand. You've got the embedded chip problem that they probably haven't thought about. And then you have the connections problem that can ultimately kill you. Computers talk to one another. Information is transferred from one system to another. And if that information is not transferred because the computer in question doesn't understand the change of date, if the data that is transferred is affected by a date and causes a, a loss of, of uh, integrity of that data, then what has happened is that other computers are affected by that. It can be passed on and on and on. In other words, the FAA, a year ago, had a problem with the radar system. Took it into the laboratory, thought they'd fixed it, just looks great, worked great. They got it into a tower, and when you suddenly have thousands of interactions from airplanes and everything else, people problems, you name it, and it didn't work. So they had to work on it in the live operational context. That type of interconnection is really the, the basis of the problem of Y2K. There were indeed early efforts decades ago to warn major public corporations and government organizations about the Y2K problem. Despite the fact that there have been a whole lot of so-called Y2K experts popping up in recent years, the fact is that as early as 1960, there were already a number of computer and government professionals trying to warn us about the long-term implications of dropping the first two digits of the year date code. My fear is that they've waited too long and they need to get busy and, and get started. If they wait much longer, truly, there won't be time for them to upgrade their systems, test their systems, and put them back into production. In 1967, the U.S. National Bureau of Standards was given the responsibility to resolve the controversy and went about doing that by surveying federal agencies. Well, the problem with that scenario was that the Department of Defense was by far the largest user of computers in the world, and it had more important things to worry about at the time, like the Vietnam War. 
Uh, it's a natural process, you know, to not want to have to face a, a painful situation or a difficult situation. But uh, my advice to uh, the American public is get over it. So the Department of Defense basically told the National Bureau of Standards that there was no way they were going to convert the four digits for the year date code. Now, a very able woman in the Department of Transportation, even earlier, suggested they do something in 1987. And she was laughed at, the old boy network, you know, what do you know, etc. She was right. And if they'd listened to her, we wouldn't be in the bad shape in the federal government that we are right now. In the last several years, more and more professionals working in the field of computer science have written papers, books, or have spoken publicly about what may occur at the end of the millennium as a result of Y2K. So we have to do something very, very dramatic. This should be the number one priority of every CEO in the country. We can't, uh, we can't do this without a much higher level of awareness to get everybody involved. One of the major problems everywhere is getting people to understand that Y2K is everybody's problem right now. The debate has been all or nothing. Either the system is going to stop totally or then people say, well, then there's no problem. And the problem, uh, I think the system will not stop, but that doesn't mean we don't have major problems. It is our primary goal in this program to help families and communities across the world to prepare and to work together regardless of what may or may not occur as a result of Y2K. There still exists, even in 1999, a general state of either denial, complacency, or even apathy about both the reality and the potential effects of Y2K. And unless we appreciate what may occur, we may not be ready either individually or as a civilization. In dead of winter, at the stroke of midnight, January 1st, 2000, elevators may stop. Heat may vanish. Credit cards and ATMs may cease to function. Airplanes and trains may come to a halt. Telephones and televisions may not utter a sound. Water delivery systems may not deliver water for cooking, drinking, or bathing. Street lights, stoplights, lights in buildings everywhere may flicker out. Hospitals, clinics, pharmacies may be unable to provide proper medical care. Banks, and stock markets around the world may suffer some form of meltdown. And nuclear power plants may cease to generate the electricity we need for all aspects of our daily lives. What is going to happen is a combination of events hundreds of thousands of events literally across the globe that will affect other systems. One of the key aspects of chaos theory is the idea of sensitive dependence on initial conditions, which basically means that one small thing happening over here can eventually cause really big things to happen on the other side of the world. You will start to see systems coming down. But you have a potential for power outages, water outages. My main worry is the energy grid. And if we can't get power, we can't get water. Water will be available in most municipalities, but I am convinced there are some where the water system will break down. It'll be more like a cancer where one little problem kind of leads to another problem, is connected to another problem. I think we should all prepare ourselves for a ground war on the year 2000 issue when it comes to insurance coverage. I expect we will have brownouts and regional blackouts. Communities will have disruptions, and maybe this other community will have a different disruption than this one. So it's something that is totally unpredictable. And it will just kind of spread. And, and I spoke with a lady at the IRS here a few months ago, 
And she had 3,000 people working on the on the year 2000 conversion and still can't get it completed by the year 2000. I think there are individual banks that will probably go bankrupt. There are individual credit unions that will disappear over this issue. We get people who email us and say, I'm a Y2K fixer at a major bank. And every time we try it, it crashes. There are medical machines that will fail in ICU units. What we're finding are computer programs that don't work. The hospital's revenue stream may stop, just dead stop. Some people will die. Not doing anything about the Y2K problem could lead to failure of up to 330,000 small businesses. You know, things just kind of topple over one after the other. We're talking about a loss of a way of life, you know, our dependence on this uh, uninterrupted life in which the uh, energy grid supplies a lot of our needs on a daily basis. You're going to see um, some real dislocation, panic, fear. And the problem globally is worse than it is here. Look to the countries who are emerging countries to have the worst problems. There are some developing countries in the world I think that you will not be able to make phone calls from. Some where airlines uh, will be advised not to fly. It's just going to uh, explode. The biggest problem is energy and defense. The fact is that only 24 countries are addressing the year 2000 problem. Those governments have decided either that the problem doesn't apply to them or that they'll just wait and see what doesn't work and then fix it afterwards. You know, my system is down. It's flat off the air. It just won't even boot up. It's not running. And Y2K itself, that is the changeover from December 31st, 1999 to January 1st, 2000 is not the only date in 1999 or 2000 that presents possible problems. One of those is what's called the problem of the nines, or September 9, 1999. The 9 that terrible day that uh, a lot of computers have actually been told to turn off. Everyone who has a fiscal year uh, that begins before the end of 1999 will, whether it's April 1, July 1, or in the case of the federal government, October 1, will have a fiscal year 2000 uh, challenge to deal with their financial systems, which will at that point be in the fiscal year 2000. Then we may see computers shutting down in April and May when a great many states start their fiscal year. When those computers start trying to think, so to speak, in terms of the year 2000, they may shut down. You also had July the 1st, which is going to be a big banking day. Um, expect the federal government to come in right in the middle of the summer and start working some banks that are not compliant. That's going to be possibly the first indicator for a lot of people. During the last few months of 1998, word about Y2K began to gradually enter the public consciousness. And now, in 1999, the seriousness of what may occur has spread around the world. And we found, as people come along and say, oh, we're on great shape, we're on a great track, we're in great shape, we have everything under control, look how much compliance we've got, and then the test comes back, uh, no, you're not. And when we think there's some hokey pokey going on, as it did in defense a year ago, where they wiped off for the next term a uh, couple of hundred critical mission systems, and we looked at that, we said, gee, are they working that fast suddenly to clean up that mess? And no, they weren't. They just wanted to look good, so they knocked a few off. They redefined them. They said they aren't critical mission, wham. So their total went down, and which angered me in the sense of them trying to pull that stunt. Despite all the computer systems that need to be reviewed and possibly fixed, and despite all the possible consequences of Y2K that have been outlined thus far, there is indeed ample room not only for hope, but even optimism in some areas. A number of vital government organizations, such as the Social Security Administration, have been working on Y2K since 1994 and will be ready for the year 2000. Major banks, such as Chase Manhattan, have been addressing Y2K since the early 90s and have diligently prepared for the year 2000 turnover. Even in the world of personal computers, Macintosh systems have been Y2K compliant since the mid-1980s. And President Clinton has appointed a special Y2K czar to oversee a nationwide campaign to address, 
review and resolve every aspect of Y2K as it affects America and the world. The first thing uh, we have to do is have the public feel comfortable that they know what's going on. They know what's being fixed. They know what still remains to be done. They know where the risks are. Uh, the second thing they need to know is that we're managing against the problem, not just the federal government, uh, but the major uh, companies in critical sectors in the economy. In other words, even though our society has been slow to realize the full implications of Y2K, human ingenuity is now at work on both large and small scales. The FAA has been uh, having meetings and schedules that are being set and every equipment, uh, piece of equipment has been identified that will need software modifications. We also have backup systems for backup systems. That's the way we always do business. And I'm sure that the uh, priorities of keeping flights going is going to be number one for the economy and uh, number two for the safety of everyone. The problem has been um, worked on now for two or three years um, at a steady pace and we're making good progress and I think we found the major bugs. There certainly will be a lot of little things go wrong, but as a whole, I think it'll just be more of a nuisance. Of the 150 mission critical systems in our agency, last year in, in September, uh, we completed uh, all uh, repair of all systems except for one, which should be uh, repaired shortly. Secondly, uh, we've tested all but uh, about uh, eight or nine systems. So we're, we're very confident that we're going to meet uh, uh, the dates set by uh, the government for all of our mission critical systems. At this point, uh, we have no indication that there's any reason for people to assume that there are going to be any major failings in uh, power or telecommunication or financial systems. And in fact, quite the contrary, the major companies in those industries are making very strong and good progress. And that's what I believe, too. I think people will pull together into this year 2000 version and, and we'll, we'll pull together as one unit and get this done. I don't see that there'll be a catastrophic uh, a failure where there's uh, riots and, you know, people running around shooting each other and things like that. The people that are going to get a gun and a year's supply of food and run to the mountains will find a lot of other people with guns in the mountains in a bad mood. So it's best to stay in your community. This is a community problem. We handle it at the community level. Uh, if the immediate response is to buy machine guns and camouflage and uh, lock ourselves off from our neighbors, well then what's happening is what's in the human heart is boiling to the surface. Uh, that's why Christians have got to challenge, challenge that whole mentality with a non-selfish, serving kind of mentality that makes a difference in the lives of their neighbors. It starts with you. And I think if everybody does their job and puts a lot of thought in it and, and does the right thing and just simply prepare then I think you'll, you'll make it just fine. One of the things that the Y2K event is likely to, uh, to initiate is a rediscovery of community. Most people today have lost touch with community. We live lives that are very insulated from one another. This is not the end of the world. This is a problem. Things are going to be broken. The electricity may be broken. We will have to be patient while it's being fixed. That's all. And you know what? While it's being fixed, we might actually enjoy some family time. It may be also that uh, we come to realize that technology doesn't supply all the answers that we hoped it had. Uh, one of the ways that we're going to be testing ourselves, of course, is to have a more concerned relationship with our fellow man. I think that really goes without saying. I think it's possible that we end up with a disconnection from our toys, a stronger connection to other human beings, uh, cautious and wiser reliance on technology uh, and a greater love for the simple things of life which is what life is really about. I think our modern age has been disconnected from the true values of life and I think all of that could result on the other side of Y2K if we approach it the right way. I know that we did good patient care 25 years ago minus a lot of these very high-tech devices and we can do it again if should they fail in the year 2000. My view of it is is that it's an opportunity to redefine relationships that can emerge far stronger than what we've got today. I'm confident that we're going to uh, rally around uh, uh, whatever the problems are, we will meet them as we have met all the other problems we've had and that basically we will move forward and be uh, stronger uh, as a result of all of this work and effort.
By this time, in the year 1999, the term Y2K has entered the public consciousness. World leaders in government, spiritual, and corporate circles have all found themselves in one of the greatest dilemmas facing humankind. But the dilemma is not Y2K itself. Rather, the concern for world leaders is how we, as individuals, as communities, should best approach Y2K. But the reality is there are no Y2K experts. And this is because nothing like this has ever occurred before in the history of humankind. The reality is no one knows exactly what's going to happen. So the real dilemma facing not only world leaders, but each one of us is how to find a clear, reasonable, balanced approach between those who call for extreme survival measures versus those who advise no action at all. The very best we can hope to do, therefore, is to prepare as individuals and as families so that we each feel secure and to work together in small and large communities as local and global neighbors. Hi, I'm Ted Wright. I spent four and a half years in Special Forces, almost continuous combat, and I travelled from El Alamein in Rome. I was part of the Desert Rats team, and I ended up at uh, outside Rome, and I survived Anzio. I have seen just about every condition of human misery and privation in my time. I am a family safety preparedness consultant. I've been doing what I do for 18 years. I'm happy to be a, a part of this team and I hope that uh, our message will be received positively. Concentrate on basic needs that you might have to spend a couple of weeks using those supplies before a distribution system is uh, renewed. I think it's a very important thing for uh, communities to have a constructive dialogue uh, with their elected leaders and their local uh, businesses about what their state of preparedness is and what their state of readiness is. Learn how to put a little water away. Know how much per person to put away. Know uh, how much cash you're going to need on hand, if any. Know what you're going to do. Water, and I've said it for years, is going to be a prime problem in this country with regards to fresh drinking water. It's already a problem now. It's been highlighted in newspapers, periodicals, magazines have all run specials on this. Have a minimum of at least four weeks water for each family member in storage as soon as possible. One gallon per person is accepted by FEMA and the Red Cross as the very basic requirement. So for one month, 30 gallons per person is your target. Other than buying water, Fill every container that you use, milk, juice, soda pop, rinse it out and fill it with fresh tap water and store containers in a cool, dark place. I have containers all over my house, all over my yard, I have them in the bedroom, I have them in the linen closet. Store them, store them, store them. Fresh water properly stored lasts for years. The enemy of water is light and heat. We now have excellent technical advances that have resulted in very compact, portable, inexpensive water filters that we can process our water through and know that it's safe to drink no matter how long it's been in storage. If you are in doubt, filter the water using a good water filter now available in the uh, $30 range and up. Be sure it is at least a 0.05 micron or less because then it will filter out possible bacteria. But if you have no filter and have doubts, boil the stuff. And now let's talk about storing water for purposes other than drinking. Picture this. You get up one day, you go to the bathroom and discover you don't have water. You then realize you only have one flush per toilet and then things are going to get nasty and unpleasant. What do you do about this? Well, ahead of time, store water in volume for this purpose. Next to the need for drinking water, need for flushing water is number two. Fill trash cans, drums, or any large containers, no matter if they're clean or not. We're not talking about drinking water here. We're talking about toilet water, 
quantity, not quality, is the order of the day. In rainy areas, put barrels under the gutter spout and you have free water. Now, in most of the manuals put out by the Red Cross and FEMA, it tells you to put a plastic trash bag in your toilet and use the toilet normally, seal the bag when it's sufficiently finished, but that is one of the most destructive things we can possibly do, and I urge everybody, as I have done for years, do not use plastic bags for your toilet. As soon as you seal the bag, the waste inside starts to cook, and that generates germs, it generates all sorts of bacteria, so those plastic trash bags are going to deteriorate and you're going to have a potential for an outbreak of disease like you never saw before. If the toilet doesn't work, a chemical toilet is the answer. The chemical toilet is most desirable for family safety. They're very affordable, costing even less than $60. If you cannot afford a chemical toilet, well, a good-sized bucket and an adapted toilet seat will work if you're careful. Use this toilet, and when finished, empty down the regular toilet. By observing the reaction of the flushing as you dump the homemade chemical toilet, you will learn how much water to keep in the bucket at all times. Under no circumstances dump the chemical toilet waste of any kind in the yard. Let's take the example of an apartment complex with 50 units in it. We have to get together. We have to put the responsibility on the owner or the management of the apartment buildings to make a communal toilet, to pull in the toilets that we see on the construction sites, etc. If people have to pay an extra dollar a month in their rent to make sure they have some toilets out there for them, like we do at uh, expositions and ball games. If they can do it for ball games and gatherings, we can do it for an apartment complex or condominium complex. Personal hygiene is always a problem with no water. Stock up on baby wipes. Clean underarms and private areas daily with baby wipes. The next thing you want to do is really get stuff that you eat, that you're used to eating, that will last in the year 2000. There's, uh, there's tons of things such as tuna fish, potted meat, all kinds of potted uh, meat products, bean products. And so we're urging that people prepare food, water, other things for about a month to six weeks. The other aspect of that is that we're urging people strongly not to think that they can survive this alone. This is about community. It's about networks. And so beyond about a month, you have to be networked and you have to be in community. Uh, there's no way any one family could lay aside you know, enough food, enough resources to survive this thing on their own. You need to have a minimum of four weeks of food for this emergency for each family member. Same as the water, remember? And also, pets are family members, and they need food and water for the same period of time. The body needs a high concentration of protein and minerals to stay healthy. 50 to 60 grams of protein a day is a good guide, and the average adult should consume this much protein. That is approximately 1,500 grams of protein a month. If you have the time, a dehydrator is worth its weight in gold at this particular time. Homemade jerky can be stored with white rice to absorb any extra moisture it may have after processing. Mary Bell's book on dehydrating food is a great resource if you want to try home dehydrating. We must learn the fundamentals and be like a squirrel. We must get a little bit and put it away, a little bit and put it away. In my own teachings, I teach the bin method. I, I talk about a 30-gallon trash bin, but it can be a smaller container. You need a container with a good tight lid that you can put food in. Once you have stored your protein, then work on storing other foods you will need. Here are some suggestions. Dried beans, rice, powdered milk, dried fruit, powdered protein drinks, alfalfa seeds for sprouting, and any canned foods you might like. If you have the money, MREs, Meals Ready to Eat, can be purchased from military surplus stores or from many sites on the internet.
The sooner you start your preparations, the better your opportunity to get the supplies you need at reasonable prices. Y2K specifically is going to affect our utilities and our services. We can't do anything about the telephone, we can't put the power back on, but we have to have alternate means of heating and alternate means of lighting. Now that we have covered the subjects of food and water storage, let's move on to the problems of staying warm and having emergency lighting. If you have a fireplace or a wood stove and you don't have any fuel or you've run out of fuel, you can burn newspapers hand rolled into logs. Basically you roll the newspapers very tightly and fasten them with metal wire. As for heat, a good modern kerosene heater is the way to go. They are safe, do need ventilation of course, but are very efficient and economical, using under 10 gallons a week, burning 10 hours a day. I stress the need to reduce the logistics. Don't try to heat the whole house. Select one room large enough for the family and use that one room for living in. For this four week period, it's not that big a deal. There is a new, a long life flashlight and boy, it's apart from all the rest. I have one, and it's just amazing. Mine will go two years on one battery. Candles are a pleasant but controversial light source. If you are going to use them, be very, very careful, as they can be as dangerous as they are useful, especially around children. You may want to purchase an oil lamp from your favorite discount store. Oil lamps are one of the most economical ways to provide emergency lighting. Two gallons of lamp oil is approximately a month's supply using your oil lamp five hours a day. There is also the crank radio and light that is very, very efficient. Hot meal? Sure if you want to. Keep warm? Why not in a reduced living area? Be sure to stockpile plenty of the fuels you know you'll be using such as firewood, kerosene, lamp oil, etc. You may want to have fire starter bricks and extra lighters available. Make sure you have plenty of batteries on hand for your flashlights. If you don't already have one, a fire extinguisher. You should have a good basic first aid kit. I have urged people for years, go to your doctor and ask for an extra prescription so you can cycle your prescriptions and have a month ahead of you. No doctor will issue a prescription ahead of time. We have to change the thinking of the AMA. Make sure you, you have your medication through the year 2000. Um, you'll want to make sure you get it perhaps filled in December of 99, that hopefully by three months from then, through January and February of 2000, as they work through the glitches, should there be a glitch, that by the time you're ready to fill your prescription in March, you'll have the computer system fixed and your medication will be um, available to you. And the medication problem, as far as I'm concerned, is a time bomb waiting to go off and it's going to be very, very serious. Make sure you have enough prescription medicine to last for this period of time. You will need to talk to your doctor about this. Home remedies and herbal teas. Have a good four week supply of toilet paper, paper towels, lawn trash bags, diapers if you have a baby, feminine products, contact lens solution, and good personal grooming items of your choice. You will need handy tools such as duct tape, a handsaw, crowbar, hammer and nails, pliers, screwdrivers, and rope. Uh, you may want to put some money aside uh, because that uh, you may not be able to get to your bank. Your bank may be down uh, for a week or two, and, and it would be a discomfort. You, I mean, to People may not accept checks, uh, so having some cash might be a good idea. People don't usually understand the idea of fractional reserve banking, that when they make a deposit, only a very small portion is actually kept with the bank. Even of that deposit, only 1.2% of our total money supply is in cash. So that if everybody ran to the banks tomorrow, they'd only be getting maybe a penny on the dollar in return if they wanted in cash. Well, that kind of information floating around in society is what's going to cause some tremendous panic, I think. It may be a good idea to have some cash on hand, although experts vary in their opinions. By personal choice, put coin and cash away as much as you feel 
you are comfortable with. Get a copy of all financial records such as bank statements, mortgage statements, credit card statements and all important documents. Store them in a safe place. Have written proof of financial assets as much as you can. We do not recommend pulling all of your money out of the bank. Just document what is there. Tell your children they don't have to worry about Y2K because your family will be prepared if the water or electricity goes out for a few days. Uh, with children, it's very important to reassure kids that uh, this is not the end of the world. Involve them in a meaningful way. You know, if it comes to storing a little food or, you know, putting batteries in the flashlights, you, you give kids a meaningful role in the, uh, in the process because it literally is true that in times of catastrophe, everyone is a leader at one time or another. If your child is old enough to understand Y2K and to help out around the house, you need to explain Y2K to him. Let him help prepare. If the child is not old enough to help you or understand Y2K, then don't tell them. I mean, it'll be part of their life experience that they'll, children are pretty, pretty resilient. They'll, they'll figure this is normal. Be sure you have provided for your well-being and morale. Have games that require no electricity, books, playing cards, puzzles and crafts. These will keep you and your children happily occupied. Tell your friends and relatives that preparing for temporary shortages and outages caused by Y2K is a good insurance policy. You don't expect your house to burn down, but you're still insured against that possibility. Now that you have seen some of the ideas in this program, you know how easy it is to start your own short-term preparations. Many people, especially those who live alone, are overwhelmed by the potential of this Y2K dilemma. Remember, all problems have a solution, and people will continue to work on the problems we have outlined in this presentation. If you would like more information about my educational materials regarding Y2K, my newsletter or other products, please call 1-800-948-8301. I think that it's prudent, uh, just as companies are planning for year 2000, so also is it prudent for individuals to engage in that same type of thinking. I'm going to buy a generator and a, at least a, enough of water for a month's supply, a month's supply of food. Basically, we're prepared for a couple of three months. I don't think it'll last that long, but it's not that expensive in 1999 prices early. I plan to do and uh, is to store a month's worth of food and, and, and a month's worth of water. I will make uh, my bank send me all my records. I'm keeping all my receipts for all of my medical expenses for the year 2000 or for the year 1999. Why don't you test yourself? Why don't every home test? Why not go home next weekend? Why not Friday night? Turn the box off, turn the electric off, go shut the water off, okay? Uh, have a few bucks in your pocket. Uh, see what you need. Y2K is a computer problem, but it's going to face the individual with their own reality. And whatever that reality is, it's going to face you face to face with a mirror. And in that mirror, there's going to be you. Here's a checklist to help you, your family, and your community prepare for Y2K. Do you have at least a three-week supply of water on hand? Do you have at least a three-week supply of food ready? Primarily canned and dried foods, which are not dependent upon refrigeration for freshness. Do you have hard copies of all your important documents, such as bank statements, stocks, assets, birth certificates, and so on? Do you have emergency independent lighting, such as flashlights, kerosene lamps, oil lamps, candles, and matches? Since Y2K will happen in the dead of winter, if you live in colder climates, do you have emergency heating methods or other means to stay warm, such as a well-prepared fireplace, at least three weeks of kindling, real or synthetic fireplace logs, as well as sleeping bags, heavy quilts, heavy coats, thick gloves, thermal underwear, and socks. Do you have backup cooking methods available, such as a kerosene camping stove, barbecue with ample supply of charcoal, or 
a fireplace and cookware appropriate for an open flame. If you are continuously reliant upon prescription medicine, have you made provisions with your doctor to have at least a three-month supply of medicine after January 1st, 2000? Likewise, if you have a medical condition which requires continuous care, have you made provisions with your doctor to make sure your necessary medical care will be uninterrupted throughout the year 2000? Do you have a first aid kit? And have you customized it for the potential needs of you and your family? If you have critical care home nursing equipment, have you checked with the seller or manufacturer to make sure that none of the equipment may be affected by Y2K microchip failure? If you'll be pregnant in the year 2000, have you made special provisions with your doctor to ensure a smooth delivery of your newborn child? In the event that telephone systems, satellite networks, television, or radio temporarily become inoperative, do you or your nearby neighbors have a ham radio as a backup for communications and to keep abreast of newsworthy developments? Have you made specific plans to secure heirlooms and other valuables important to you and your family? Have you contacted your local phone, water, and power companies, both about uninterrupted service and about accurate billing statements in the year 2000? If you live in a skyscraper or other high-rise dwelling, have you and your co-tenants conferred with building management regarding backup generator for the entire building? regarding emergency provisions for heat, light, water, and waste management. If you live in a community of neighborhood homes, have you begun organizing with family, friends, and town leaders to prepare contingency plans for the first two to three months of the year 2000, particularly regarding emergency food, water, and heat provisions? Have you made special contacts with any elderly or disabled folks to see if they could use a little help? And have you communicated with your local, county, state, and federal representatives to make sure they're doing everything in their power to prepare for Y2K? Finally, one good thing to remember regarding all of these items of preparation is that regardless of what may or may not occur as a result of Y2K, all of these things will still be useful to you and your family. And the efforts to organize with our neighbors will be beneficial to all parties concerned no matter what does or does not happen. There is an ancient myth of what might have been the most highly advanced civilization ever to dwell on the planet Earth. But that is indeed just an ancient myth we're now, without question, living in one of the greatest periods in all human history. It's both an exciting and challenging time to be alive. We both enjoy and are awestruck by the unbelievably rapid advancements in human ingenuity and technology. Yet, how fragile do we now find ourselves before the juggernaut of our own inventions? However, as we indicated earlier in this program, there are no Y2K experts. No one knows exactly what, if anything, will happen. And our individual and collective response to Y2K is actually far more important than Y2K itself. The experts that we're dealing with uh, indicate that it's going to hit hard and heavy for a while, maybe, be, maybe look like what some are calling a meltdown scenario for a week or two, and then it's going to level out more to brown out. On a scale of one to five, how bad the Y2K is going to be globally, five being the worst. I would say globally they're at a five. In the States, we have been at a four. I think we're going to end up about a two. My personal sense of this is uh, in the range of three. I think there are going to be major disruptions. I think there are going to be uh, things that uh, we can deal with, but it won't be easy. Putting January 1 on a scale of one to five, with five being the worst, and one being nothing at all. My assumption is somewhere around a 2.5. Again, an annoyance, a nuisance, a lot of different things that don't work. Catastrophic, I don't think so. I would say a three. I, I think maybe we're looking at maybe a three. 
I think based on the utility companies, I think there will be some power outages or we'll have brownouts in some cases. I would say there would probably be fall around a, a three or a four. My personal opinion is it can only be a five. It can't be any less than a five. I would probably have to rate this right in the middle at two and a half. And the reason is because we know that this is an inevitable circumstance. I would put the year 2000 problem for the world at a three with a wait and see attitude. In a very real way, we're all responsible for Y2K and there's no one to blame, morally or otherwise. We've all benefited from the technologies which have improved our lives and we have therefore encouraged those same technologies to develop at ever more accelerated rates. And yes, perhaps we are now realizing that we've taken them a bit for granted and have indeed become too dependent upon the byproducts of our collective innovations. And so, we must not only prepare as families and work together as neighbors, but we need also use this moment in the development of our civilization as an opportunity to look at the long-range effects of all our human endeavors. Looking beyond Y2K, whatever perils our very human ambitions and short-sightedness may lead us to, our even more powerful human spirit will find a way to overcome. So, let us use the Y2K challenge as an opportunity to reflect on where we're headed as a civilization, perhaps the most important opportunity we've ever had. If the omission of two simple digits can have worldwide impact several decades after its inception, we must ask ourselves, before we rush too far forward, what are we doing now in genetic engineering, with cloning, with the development of bacteriological warfare life forms, with death ray technologies, and pollution of land, air, and water that could have long-term, unpredictable worldwide effects? And what can we do as the inheritors the caretakers of this world. What can we do to protect our home, our island in space? See you.